Welcome to Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy, and this is all of the Easter eggs, references, and little things that you might have missed in The Mandalorian, Chapter 12. Now, before we get into this chapter's Easter eggs, I want to shout out my new favorite obsession, the top Star Wars trading card app, who are also the sponsor of this week's video. I was a massive card collector back in the day, and this app lets me collect and trade cards, but all on my phone. And they've included characters from the films, Rebels, Clone Wars, and most importantly, The Mandalorian. I love how some of the cards even feature animation like a motion poster. But my favorite part of this app is that I can trade with other Star Wars fans, like this guy, FunDug77. I wonder who that is. If you download the app, you can trade with me, username Ryan Airy. I'm trying to collect the full set of the Mandalorian series with their Mando Mondays promotion. That's where they release new cards from last week's episode, like this one of Sasha Banks or Mando fighting beside Bo-Katan. So, if you're interested, download the Star Wars Card Trader app by Tops. Moving on. Get on with it. Yes, get on with it! Normally, this show is filled with callbacks to the original trilogy, but this episode had plenty of foreshadowing of the sequel trilogy. I think we'll look back and say this was the episode that started to bridge the two eras of Star Wars. First off, I love the opening. Make sure you hold them apart from... No, hold them apart. <laughs> Reminded me of Baby Groot in Guardians 2. Groot. No! The Razor Crest rickety engine sound is the same as the Millennium Falcons. <laughs> and Ben Burt originally recorded the sound from the engine of a failing biplane. When we return to Navarro, we see the covert where the Mandalorians lived in season one. Notice the Mythosaur skull is gone. Now maybe scavengers took it, but I think it's more likely that the armorer brought it to wherever she escaped to. And by the way, we have a full video about the armorer's origins and how she was probably a follower of Darth Maul. You should check that one out. Cara Dune is played by former UFC fighter Gina Carano, and she gets to show off some of her ultimate fighting moves in this scene. She's taking down some Aqualish, the same species as Ponda Baba back in A New Hope. <laughs> That is not the last callback to New Hope we'll see in this episode. By the way, I don't recognize the species of this space weasel, do you? If you do, let me know in the comments. The animal is used as a neat storytelling device to show that she's moving on from violence. This shows that emotionally, she stopped trying to avenge Alderaan and now is trying to rebuild new worlds. Now, does the spy who worked on Mando's ship look familiar? He looks like the same species as Ochi, the Sith assassin who killed Rey's parents, but I don't think it's him. Ochi worked for Yup Tashu, who was an advisor to the Emperor. This guy's a mechanic who's working his way up the ladder. You'll be well rewarded in the new era. And notice that it's morning in Navarro. Everybody's wearing bright collars, it's no longer a scary place, but there's still Jawas roaming around, grifting to make a buck. But notice here that they've actually made a statue of IG-11, the droid that died saving their town from the Empire. I must be destroyed. <laughs> And the CD Bounty Hunter Bar has become a school that is loaded with Easter eggs. The teacher is a protocol droid, which is appropriate since these machines are programmed for etiquette and are filled with useless knowledge. The possibility of successfully navigating an asteroid field is approximately three... Th She's giving a geography lesson and the arabesque letters on the board spell out things like gravitational vector and key point. Also, we saw star maps like this in the original trilogy. The teacher asks... Can you name one of the five major trade routes in the galaxy? Now, if you remember, it was the taxation of trade routes that started this whole mess to begin with. So basically, these trade routes are actually plots through hyperspace, similar to the Kessel Run we saw in Solo. Several hyperspace routes are name-dropped, including the Corellian Run, named after Han Solo's home planet, and the Hydean Way, which was first mentioned in the Clone Wars. We shall reinforce our fleet along the Hydean Way. The teacher also mentions that Coruscant was the capital of the Empire and the Old Republic, and that the New Republic's capital is on Shandrila. Now, in the New Republic, the capital actually rotated to different planets every few years. This was the location of the capital in Chuck Wendig's Aftermath trilogy. The teacher also mentions the Akadiz Maelstrom, which Han flew through to complete the Kessel Run, and she even asks how many orbits are in the Kessel system. But I was most intrigued when she mentioned the Outer Rim, the Core Worlds, and then said there are other regions in the galaxy. This implies the Unknown Regions, where the Emperor rebuilt his body, the Sith fleet, and where, after after the war, the Empire retreated and became the First Order. This is one of many subtle links to the Abrams sequel trilogy, like this kid who's wearing the same hairstyle as Rey in The Last Jedi. But the best part of the school scene is Baby Yoda asking for macaroons. No, go find your own. Horatio Sands returns as Mithril, Mando's bounty from the first scene in the show. He says, I do not want to spend any more time in carbonite. Still can't see out of my left eye. 
and this is a reference to the carbonite blindness that we first saw in Return of the Jedi. I can't see. Your eyesight will return in time. Karga is running the planet. Appropriate, since last season we found out that he was a... Disgraced magistrate. Now, I don't recognize the model of this speeder. It's very similar to Luke's X-34, note the grill on the front. But it's not the XP-38 that made his speeder outdated. Ever since the XP-38 came out, they just aren't in demand. If you know the speeder, let me know down in the comments. Kara says... Dink fair. A curse word that we've been hearing a lot lately. Dink Ferrick. Dink Ferrick. Basically, it's the outer rim equivalent of saying mother sucking talking scraping double pounding bantha poodoo. Mithril slobbers all over this Trexler Marauder, a new vehicle similar to the Imperial Troop Transport that we saw last season. Now, it's a small detail, but I appreciate the uniformity of design that we see in this show. The windows of this base are the same design as Star Destroyers, which were inherited from the Republic ships and were later copied by the First Order. See, little things like this really help bridge the stories between eras. They have an Imperial code cylinder, which we first saw in A New Hope. And when he says, There's no guardrail on this, come on! I laughed out loud because it reminded me me of this. So anyway, I says forget the dental plan, forget sick leave, I just want a railing. You know, one railing, right here. The Arabesh on this console says core temp. And did anyone notice that Mando could have just flown in and out of this shaft anytime he wanted? Ooh, superhero landing. He should have just gone in full Han. Bring him on, I prefer a straight fight to all this sneaking around. Then they come across these scientists and we get a huge clue about what the Empire wants to use Baby Yoda for. Now, first of all, these men are dressed in a similar uniform as Dr. Pershing from season one, and they even wear the same patch on their shoulders. This patch was actually first seen on the clone troopers training on Kamino. Now, this doesn't mean that these guys are clones. They could just work for the cloners or be part of the same gene splicing guild. And the meter on this board is very similar to the one that we saw on this device that read the child's vitals back in episode three. So let's talk about what's actually going on here. Pershing says, I highly doubt we'll find a donor with a higher M count though. Now that M count he's referring to is most likely midichlorians. You remember those. Midichlorians are a microscopic life form that resides within all living cells. Without the midichlorians, life could not exist. And we would have no knowledge of the force. I think they steered away from actually saying the name midichlorians because the fan base railed so hard against the whole idea of microscopic life forms being the source of the force. And the force? Well, that's just microscopic bacteria in your bloodstream called midichlorians. Look, if you're not gonna take this seriously, I'm out. Now, if you'll remember, the more midichlorians one has, the stronger your force abilities. It is possible he was conceived by the midichlorians. So the child has an excess of midichlorians. This is probably the genetic material that Herzog references in episode three. Extract the necessary material. So what does the Empire want with midichlorians? Well, the Rise of Skywalker novelization has the answers. The Sith cultists on Exegol were able to clone the Emperor's body, but without midichlorians, the body could not be force sensitive. So the Empire is trying to draw midichlorians from Baby Yoda to make force sensitive clones. Sadly, the body rejected the blood. But I don't think these clones are the Emperor. To me, they look more like Snoke, who was also a force sensitive clone. And as we saw in The Rise of Skywalker, Palpatine had a whole jar full of Snokes at the ready. I made Snoke. In fact, this piece of the score What the? is actually sampled from a track that's from The Force Awakens called Snoke. Leading them to the last Jedi. So this means that baby Yoda is marked for death. It's inevitable that he will be murdered in this show before our very eyes so the Empire can make a clone of Palpatine. In the arms of the angel. Star Wars has always used the wipe transition, but this episode employed them a little differently as fast cuts during an action scene, probably so they could use the same hallway over and over. Oh, and hey, look at this random Imperial guy who's hiding and wearing jeans and a t-shirt. Oopsie. Another cool detail on this show is how the graphics on the tanks console and all the readouts look very 80s, the era the original trilogy was created in. The readouts are actually only a little more advanced than Atari games like Tank Commander. The final chase was amazing, very Fury Road. I was on the edge of my seat because these were all supporting characters who could very much die. I was also afraid that this dude would have kidnapped Baby Yoda and the rest of the season would be a rescue mission. They're running from scout troopers on speeder bikes like we first saw in Return of the Jedi, and then they're pursued by the Outland TIE fighters like the one Moff Gideon piloted. By the way, this is me when I get a pack of Oreos all to myself. 
Paul Sung Hung Lee from Kim's Convenience returns as X-Wing pilot Carson Teva. His scenes give us even more foreshadowing about the rise of the First Order. See, earlier in the episode, Karga dismisses the Republic's presence in the Outer Rim. I had a run-in with the New Republic. They should leave the Outer Rim alone. If the Empire couldn't settle it, what makes them think they can? This is showing that there is a power vacuum, and later we see him being cagey just trying to get the cops out of his town. Not that I can think of, officer, but if something does come to mind, I'll be sure to send you a gram. And he also name drops Coruscant, the former Imperial capital. This isn't Coruscant. But see, if Grief Cargo would have just cooperated and Mando went to the Republic, then they could bring the child to Luke for training. But because people in the Outer Rim distrust authority, they try to go it alone. There's something going on out here. They don't believe it on the core worlds, but it's true. And these aren't isolated incidents. They need to be stopped before it's too late, but we can't do it without local support. This stubbornness and paranoia actually allowed the First Order to gain a foothold in the Outer Rim before branching out and conquering the entire galaxy. He mentions that Kara is from Alderaan. Did you lose anyone? I lost everyone. And then he leaves her with a marker of the Rebel Alliance. So maybe she's going to rejoin the New Republic, or at least bring them into the fight by the end of the season. Moff Gideon's Star Destroyer is introduced with the same shot that opened the entire series in A New Hope. We find out that this spy planted a tracker, a move the Empire also pulled in A New Hope. For sure the homing beacon is secure aboard their ship. And then Moff Gideon gets the news while standing in a hallway full of dark troopers. At least I think they're dark troopers. These are advanced battle droids that first appeared in the Dark Forces video game. But now, their only canon appearance is in the mobile game Star Wars Commander, which, sidebar, was a lame Clash of Clans imitation with figures that were too small to actually tap on. One out of five stars. This lab technician is wearing the logo of the Imperial Department of Military Research. Now that's a deep cut Easter egg because this group has only appeared in role-playing games and were briefly mentioned in the novel Tarkin. This episode was directed by Carl Weathers, and this was the second Star Wars project he's ever helmed. The first one was your mom. Well, that's all the references I found, but if you found any, let me know down in the comments or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.